Okay, so just to, to say hello and thank you for coming along today. I'm Krista Kalman. I'm Professor of History at the University of Lincoln, but shortly to move to be Professor of Modern History at the University of Leicester. And my talk today is looking at the historical, social and political context of the Clapham Common Vigil. So I think many of you will have seen in the newspapers in March this rather shocking image of a woman being arrested by a large group of police officers at the end of a vigil that was held to commemorate the life of Sarah Everard, who was murdered um, sort of in a random attack in London in March. What I want to do in the talk today is start off by offering a historical context for the events on Clapham Common, so to give you some idea of where they came from and what sort of background there was to them. Um, I'll, finish off by, I'll finish off by offering you a very, very quick indication of the various types of university courses where you might encounter this sort of history if you're interested or this sort of material, because it's not just in history courses that you could, that this lecture would fit. The main thing that you need to understand today that you might not have encountered before is this idea of the wave metaphor. And the idea of the wave metaphor came about in the 1960s in the what was then the second women's movement. Daniel, isn't it? it was used as a way of connecting the Thank you. 1960s women's liberation movement with earlier campaigns, with earlier women's campaigns. And the idea behind the wave metaphor is that there are waves of feminism. And currently we're said to be on about the fourth wave. A lot of critics are very, very unhappy with the wave metaphor for a number of reasons. And the main reason is that they say that it suggests that while the waves have peaks, I'm moving my pointer here, I hope you can see it. While the waves have peaks when things are very visible, it also suggests that there were troughs when nothing was really happening. And a very well-known feminist campaigner in Britain in the 1920s was interviewed in the 1970s and asked, what did you do when there wasn't a women's movement? And she said, that's ridiculous. There's always been a women's movement this century. And it's just the idea of the wave metaphor that means that you don't see what's going on when things are less visible. But it is a useful way of mapping these high points of activism. And it all really started at the end of the 19th century and then the beginning of the 20th century were what's now known as first wave feminism, which was concerned with social and political equalities took place. First wave feminism was very concerned with access to education because at that time women couldn't even go to university. Access to professions once women became able to go to university because they were then graduating but couldn't get what today we would call graduate level jobs because they weren't allowed to be doctors or architects or lawyers. Divorce law reform, Married Women's Property Act and then most famously the vote which became a large national campaign in about 1890 and kept going until 1928, but had its high point of activism with the suffragette movement in the Edwardian period, so sort of 1906 to 1914. The second wave of feminism is what's sometimes referred to as the women's liberation movement. And this took place between the 1960s and round and about 1990. And the second wave was much, much, much more concerned with individual equalities and personal campaigns. So equal pay, but also things like equal access to childcare, to free childcare, abortion, which was still illegal until 1967, and then campaigns such as Wages for Housework, which argued that women's unpaid labour, women's hidden labour, should be paid for by the state because it was what one of the key things that kept society going. And this was often summarised in the second wave feminist slogan, the personal is political, 
There was also a lot of emphasis on things like campaigns for safer childbirth and different ways of doing childbirth and better medical knowledge for women as well. The third wave was something that took place between about the 1990s and the 2010s, but it's a little bit more difficult to map. And one of the things that fueled it was the move of second wave feminists into the academy. So a lot of universities in the 1980s started teaching women's studies as an academic subject, mostly as postgraduate rather than undergraduate. Sally Alexander, who is somebody that we'll come back to later in our talk, was a feminist activist in the second wave, who by the third wave had become professor of women's history at Goldsmiths University. And there was a lot of work being done looking into the history of women's history, women's literature, finding forgotten writers, publishing houses like the Women's Press and Virago that were reprinting forgotten classes, classics by women's writers. And a little bit ironic that today, many women's historians working in universities today are now researching the lives and activism of these second wave feminists who in turn came into feminist activism and started researching the lives of, of first, first wave feminism. And some of the things which characterise the third wave as well were a much more strong emphasis on gender and identity politics, also on the idea of intersectionality, that is the woman is not a single category. There isn't such a thing as a woman, but there are black women, gay women, working class women, Latino women. So it's a much more diverse category. And then into cultural politics through things like the Riot Girl movement with bands like Bikini Kill, who were very keen on emphasizing not just women's rights, but girls' rights and reclaiming the world, the word girl, so that it was no longer something that was rather patronizing, you don't be a silly girl, and it was something that was a strong identity. And then moving into where we are today with the fourth wave, where there is a strong emphasis on sexual harassment and campaigns such as Everyday Sexism and Me Too that I'll come back to a little bit more towards the end. So there are quite a few continuities between the waves and one of the most obvious continuities is the idea of direct action. Direct action is an activity which doesn't necessarily have to be against the criminal law, but is always against the civil law. So it involves frequently things like obstruction, disruption, protests that really make the news and get you noticed. The suffragettes, of course, use arson and criminal damage, but also obstruction, large demonstrations to the House of Commons when you weren't supposed to have a demonstration within so many yards of the House of Commons, the House of Parliament, and um, that sort of thing. That was very, very much part of their arsenal. In the second wave, we saw, for example, women at the peace camp at Greenham Common using very, very similar tactics. So obstruction, trespass, and again, criminal damage, breaking through the perimeter fence of the base, cutting it repeatedly with wire cutters try, and trying to disrupt the day-to-day -day activities at the base, which was the site for American nuclear weapons, which were being housed in Britain at this time in the 1980s. And then in the fourth wave, we see with the, the action at the vigil in March, which was deemed to be in breach of the all tiers restrictions that were in place due to COVID. Organisers were told not to go ahead, organisers decided to go ahead. So again, this was very much a form of direct action and standing in a quite well established tradition. So what I want to do now is move on to look specifically at second wave feminism to see what direct action looked like there and to see what continuities we can see and what historical precedents we can see for what happened in London in March. The first thing that I want to draw your attention to is the idea of bra burning, which was an insult that was often 
sent out or used against second wave feminism feminists they were man hating they were they were all man haters they were all lesbians they were all witches and they were all bra burners that was another thing bra burning is one of the most interesting things because it is a myth it never happened and it's really easy historically to trace where the myth came from and why people thought it happened so in september 1968 200 women gathered in Atlantic City, New Jersey, to protest against the Miss America beauty contest. Beauty contests were very popular at the time. I'm going to say a little bit more about them in the context of, of Britain in a moment. As part of this protest, they set up what was called the Freedom Trash Can. Trash Can is a, the American for rubbish bin, street rubbish bin. And you can see the Freedom Trash Can in the picture at the bottom of the page there. And women who were coming to the protest were encouraged to bring symbols of women's oppression or differential social treatment with them to throw into the freedom trash can. So they threw in things like mops, bras, hairspray, corsets and girdles, high heels, makeup, all sorts of things that they said were symbolic of the way that they were socially oppressed and seen to be different from men and treated differently from men. There were other demonstrations going on in the USA at the time, most notably those against the Vietnam War. And one of the really popular tactics in those demonstrations was to burn the draft cards that were being sent out conscripting young American men into the army. So the idea was that they would burn the contents of the Freedom Trash Can, but they were prevented from doing that by the New Jersey police, who said this would be too much of a fire hazard. So the bra throwing away took place, but the bra burning never did take place. But it stays as a really, really key trope of second wave feminism. And one of my undergraduate students here at Lincoln has just done a very good final year dissertation, dissertation about how feminism was portrayed in television comedy in the 1970s and she's got lots of examples of clips from 1970s situation comedies where feminists are seen to be burning their bras so it became a very strong myth. The beauty contest protests in America were replicated in Britain in 1970 and some of you may be familiar with this if you've seen the film misdemeanor which came out last year which was about this very very event the miss world contest started in 1951 and between 1959 and 1988 it was broadcast every year on BBC TV. It was one of the flagship broadcasts at its peak in the 60s and 70s. It drew audiences of almost 18 million, so very, very high viewer numbers. And in 1970, a group of women who were involved in the women's liberation movement in Britain decided to go and protest outside the Miss World contest. Women's Liberation in Britain had started earlier that year with a conference, a meeting at Ruskin College, Oxford. And although it's an Oxford college, Ruskin College is very, very atypical. It's for mature students and particularly for trade unionists and trade union activists. And that was where the first conference took place and where the British second wave feminist movement, which is generally called the Women's Liberation Movement, started out. They drew up a series of demands and then they also started to arrange a number of activities all over the country. So they protested outside of the hall, but they also managed to get inside the hall and Bob Hope, the famous American comedian, was comparing the event and when he started making very, very sexist jokes and saying that it was right, you know, he thought it was just like a cattle market, they started protesting and they had whistles and rattles and threw leaflets down from the balcony. Very, very disruptive event. And also echoed, interestingly, identical tactics that suffrage campaigners had used against the Liberal Party in the very same venue in 1906 and 1908. So again, a, a continuity there. And this was the first high profile action of second wave feminism in Britain.
But most relevant for our purposes was the Reclaim the Night movement, which started in the 1970s. And again, just like the Miss World protest, Reclaim the Night had an international genealogy. There are some claims that it started in Brussels during a meeting of what was known as the International Tribunal of Crimes Against Women. This saw delegates from around 30 countries discussing issues such as rape, which was still legal in marriage in many countries at this time, domestic abortion, sorry, domestic violence, abortion, pornography, and women's in, in economic inequalities. Diana Russell, one of the organisers, later denied that there'd been an evening event, but she said we did have lots of parties and we had meetings in the evenings. But the idea that there had been a torchlit protest somehow picked up cur currency and was, they thought, replicated, but actually initiated in Rome in December 1976. The quotation here is from the New York Times coverage of the event and it was prompted by rising street violence against women including a recent series of rapes that very very high numbers well over a hundred in the space of a year so they held a torchlit a torchlit march across the city in one evening in december 1976 saying that they wanted to reclaim the night for themselves that they had the right to be out at night as well a very similar event took place in Germany the following April, but this time it took place in more than one city and it was very, very widely reported. Firstly, in Courage, a German feminist magazine, and then the report was translated into English and carried in Spare Rib, the English feminist newspaper. And feminists in Britain began to discuss whether such an event could actually take, could take place here. The German marches used slogans such as we're not sweet, we're not sour, we're not cattle to be looked over. It, it rhymes in German, it doesn't rhyme as well in English. And they targeted sex shops and they used flower bombs. But some of the marches were attacked by men who were very angry that the march was taking place. The discussions about whether or not we should have one in England or in Britain had a very specific context in parts of the UK and particularly in Yorkshire. There had been several attacks by this point by the serial killer who the police were starting to call or were about to start to call the Yorkshire Ripper. They hadn't quite used this title at this point. And there was a lot of concern that the police were not taking these attacks seriously because many of them were on against prostitutes. And here is the now infamous article from the Daily Mail in 1977 that explains why so many women got angry about this. And if you look at the, the language here, the Mail, sorry, the Daily Mirror, the Mirror doesn't even use the term prostitute. It uses the term good time girl as a euphemism. And in 1977, after killing five prostitutes and attacking several more women, but at the time the police said that some of the attacks were nothing to do with the same serial killer because they were not on prostitutes. There was a killing of a 16 year old schoolgirl called Jane MacDonald in Leeds, and it was unmistakably the work of the same man. But you can see George Oldfield, the assistant chief constable, says, and I'll read out the quote because it is really shocking. I feel sure Jane was killed by mistake. The murderer didn't know she was a good, innocent young girl. And the, the point here is he's saying that, uh, it says a bit earlier on in the report, all but one of his victims were good time girls. Jane was completely innocent. And women's groups were outraged at the reporting of these attacks, which suggested that it was the fault of the women who were murdered because they were behaving in a way that was just going to bring down male retribution against them. 
And the other thing that women got very angry about was the way that the police handled it by saying women shouldn't go out on their own. They should only go out in groups. If you go to the pub with your friends and there's nobody to take you home, see if one of the men in the pub will walk you home. One woman who was interviewed for a project about this later recalled, I remember at the time of the Yorkshire Ripper, all these warnings were issued about what women should do to keep themselves safe, and it almost amounted to a curfew. I remember sitting in a pub with my extremely politically aware male colleagues, and I remember saying that this is really weird, it's bizarre, that if there's temporary measures to bring in, then why not do it the other way round? And until the Ripper is caught, why don't men not go out unless they're accompanied by a woman? But all the men were laughing at me. And this was a very particular time. Women in those days alone would often be refused service in pubs or pubs would serve them certain drinks but would refuse to serve them pints. Many workplaces, including schools, banned women from wearing trousers to work. Married women still had to declare their income on their husbands rather than their own tax returns and women couldn't get a mortgage without a male guarantor. As well as the impetus of the serial killings and the way that police were handling them, Leeds also had a very recent history of women's militancy when in 1970, 5,000 women from local textile firms and clothes manufacturing firms came out on strike protesting against their employer's failure to implement equal pay in their industry. And this is one of just a a, a remarkable set of photographs from the Yorkshire Evening Post that shows women from the industries coming out and marching to a mass meeting on Hunslet Moor just in the, at the, the north of the city. And this was the largest strike of women workers that had ever taken place in Britain at this time. So with the two things coming together, it's not surprising that Leeds was the site for the first Reclaim the Night March that took place in the UK on the 12th of November 1977. The following year they started to spread into other cities like Bristol, Birmingham and Liverpool. This is a report from the first Liverpool Reclaim the Night March which took place in 1988 and it shows how initially the police were really keen for the march not to happen because they said that they thought it was dangerous for women to be out marching at night which kind of completely missed the point of what the march was about they did manage to get police permission eventually and it went ahead a few weeks later and marches were held annually throughout the uk for the remainder of the 1970s and for much of the 1980s Sometimes they had a particular focus, for example, when the Conservative MP John Corrie attempted to challenge the 1967 Abortion Act in 1979, or when Liberal MP David Alton did the same in 1988. But others were just intended to highlight some of the issues facing women. As with many social movements, marches had dwindled by the mid-1990s. The initial excitement behind them had sort of fallen away. They were seen as being a bit old hat. But the transition from third wave to fourth wave feminism brought a resurgence of attention to many of the problems that an older generation of feminists thought had gone away. Such changes in mood can be difficult to pin down historically, but there are particular events that stand out. And these coalesced around a resurgence in, an in, in the interest in Reclaim the Night marches, which started up again in round and about 2012, 2013. Everyday Sexism was a campaign started by Laura Bates in 2012 after she was the victim of street harassment. Many of the small microaggressions that the project collected struck a chord with an older generation of feminists who really felt that the world had moved on from this. And the slide on the picture on the slide here is just a tiny, tiny example of some of the things that happened and some of the ways that women reacted to this. Whistles, remarks about how sexy I was, I try not to make eye contact with a group of males, being looked at and whistled at, a lot of people say it's flattering, etc, etc, etc. The 
the book of the campaign, the campaign still go, is still going on, largely on a website, but the book of the campaign, which was published in 2014, makes very depressing reading because it just lists event on event on event that was sent in to, uh, to the website as an example. In 2017, the actress Alicia Milano started the Me Too campaign, although the actual slogan had been used slightly earlier. This was her tweet, which went absolutely viral, where she said, if all the women who've been sexually harassed or assaulted wrote Me Too as a status, we might give people a sense of the magnitude of the problem. The virality of the tweet the numbers of responses that it gathered and particularly the high profile celebrities who responded to it led to much discussion across the media and to the revelations of the behaviours of certain leading figures, particularly in the television and theatre industries. For example, the revered director Harvey Weinstein, who is now in jail for the crimes that he committed against women over a number of decades. Me Too prompted a number of leading actors to found the charity Time's Up, which is intended to support victims of sexual violence and harassment. And at the Oscars in 2018, most actors attending the ceremony wore black as a symbol of solidarity with both Time's Up and Me Too. And then most recently, the book by Caroline Criado Perez, the feminist campaigner behind the statue of, of Millicent Fawcett in London and putting Mary Wollstonecraft on the banknotes, wrote a book which shows how much of what we think of as normal in society is actually modelled on male rather than female normality. Sometimes her book shows this can cause irritation, public transport that's inaccessible if you've got a baby, lack of public toilets, etc. Sometimes it can be more serious, medical trials being predicated on male rather than the female body mass, crash tests for cars being predicated on the male rather than the female body shapes. And simultaneously, for the past 10 years, there's been a lot of research by feminist geographers that show about how cities are planned and designed without women's needs in mind. So again, inaccessible public transport, unsafe public spaces, and again, the lack of access to toilets. So these offer you an immediate context to events around the Clapham Common Vigil. But just towards, as I'm coming to the end now, to make a clearer case for some of the echoes that I think sparked concern in the minds of a lot of women who saw the reporting of Sarah's disappearance. The Daily Mirror report had very, very heavy overtones of the way in which it had reported on the Ripper murders 34, 35 years earlier. And this is an example, the Daily Mirror said, women living in the area where Sarah Everard disappeared from are being warned by the police not to go out alone. The marketing manager, 33, vanished after she'd left a friend's house. She'd been due to arrive home, but after making the journey on foot, has not been seen since. Locals have now revealed that officers had told them to be vigilant following the mystery disappearance. And the... The fact that some, um, sorry, I've, missed, I've lost my last slide. The fact that they were again saying to women, you need to stay home. And then when it became very clear quite quickly that the person responsible for this crime was not just a man, but was a serving police officer, I, this sparked off the most tremendous amount of anger. And that was where the vigil came from borrowing inspiration from Reclaim the Night and the ideas of Reclaim the Night that maybe if the streets are not safe for women because of male violence, we could turn the problem around and say, shall we actually look at ways of policing men's behaviour rather than looking way at ways of policing women's behaviour? So just to conclude very quickly to give you an idea, because I know that most of you are at a stage now where you're thinking about your university choices, of where you might encounter this sort of work going on in a university because obvious, most obviously it's history but you would also find material like this in sociology courses, 
in politics courses, in literature courses where there are specialisms on women's writing, in area studies, the area of modern languages, where, for example, a lot of work is being done on history of European feminist movements, and in geography, where urban planning is starting to show us that the city is not necessarily a gender neutral place. OK, that's my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us, Christophe.